being recorded. Dear colleagues, dear friends, it's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon for this next webinar organized by the ENS School Base section. This webinar will be dedicated to the craniocervical junction, and I will share with you my screen in order to show you our program. I will first detail the approaches to the craniocervical junction and discuss a special concern with the vertebral artery management. Then Professor Roy Daniel will discuss about the organization of the muscles at this level and the hypoglossal canal. Then Professor Cornelius will speak about the stabilization strategies. It's a truly important concern when you are dealing with pathologies at the craniocervical junction level. Then Professor Schroeder will discuss about the chordomas. Then Professor Visocci will discuss Chiari malformation. And finally, Professor Frulich will discuss the choice of the best approach at the level of the craniocervical junction to treat chordomas. So I will give the first talk about the surgical approaches to reach this very interesting and complex region and discuss with you the special topic of the vertebral artery management. So the cranial cervical junction is a complex transition between the skull and the upper cervical spine. It comprises the basiocciput, the atlas, and the axis. And characteristically, it forms a funnel, which on one end provides the stability, but on the other end is also responsible for the motion, meaning more than 50% of the axial rotation of the head is performed at this level, which is a truly important concern and important uh, movement in the daily life. So what are the surgical approaches? There are a lot of approaches we can see on these pictures, but basically they are subdivided into three main kind of approach. The anterior approaches, which is not truly really the topic of uh, my talk, the lateral approaches, and the posterior approaches. If we look more specifically to the lateral and posterior approach, they are maybe better named anterolateral and posterolateral. And uh, in the US, it is called extreme lateral for the anterolateral one and far lateral for the posterolateral one. I will start with the posterolateral approach, which is mainly dedicated to intradural lesions and posterior extradural lesions. The approach is quite basic and well known. It's a standard midline, midline approach with the contra incision on the side of the pathology. And most of the time, the aponeurosis and all the muscles are mobilized in one flap laterally to the side of the approach. The vertebral artery is a concern when we would like to reach this region. The V3 segment, which is located between the C2 transverse process and the foramen magnum dura, is exposed in some circumstances. But as soon as you stay within 20 millimeters from the midline, you will not encounter the vertebral artery. So it is truly a safe zone. How to expose the vertebral artery at this level? You nicely see the superiorial dissection performed at the inferior border of the C1 posterior arch. The superiorial dissection is a key point at this level, but also as it is when we are exposing the V2 segment. Both V2 and V3 segment, I remind you that V2 is between the C6 transverse process and the C21. Both, seg both segments, V2 and V3, are surrounded by a periosteal sheet, and the artery is also surrounded by a venous plexus. In fact, characteristically, the periosteal sheet surrounding the vertebral artery is in continuity with the periosteum of the bone. So if you would like to 
correctly expose and safely expose the vertebral artery, you cannot go directly with your carison at this level inside the foramen. You have to perform a superosteal dissection outside and then inside. Then when the periosteum is elevated, you can go with your carison and you will leave in place the periosteal sheet at the level of V2 or at the level of V3, and then you will work perfectly confidently. So at V3, you have to elevate from the inferior border of the C1 posterior arch okay. and move from the inferior border to the upper aspect of the C1 posterior arch, where the vertebral artery has an horizontal portion. Then doing that from the inferior border to the superior border, and then moving from laterally to medially, you expose the vertebral artery in its growth here, and it is a safe exposure. When you want to dissect the vertebral artery, what is important, and it has to be considered preparatively, is to know if you are facing a smaller vertebral artery or a larger one. Compare it to the contralateral side. It's truly important to know what are the risks of the procedure. And in fact, depending on the size that you, the size that you will consider, less than two millimeters or up to 3.5 millimeter, you will find a smaller vertebral artery between 2.5% and 26%. So it's not uncommon. So I named this smaller vertebral artery, but smaller vertebral arteries are subdivided into two groups, either hypoplastic vertebral arteries, if there is a fusion with the contralateral one to form the basilar trunk, in this situation, if needed, a sacrifice can be performed normally without any risk. But the other condition is called atretric vertebral artery, when the vertebral artery is smaller, but ending into the pica. In this situation, even a small vertebral artery, an atretric one, cannot be sacrificed. Otherwise, you will have a posterior fossa infarct. So important anatomical variation that have also to be known are the variation of the pica. The pica usually arise from the intradural segment of the vertebral artery, which is V4, but in five to 20 percent of the cases, the pica may arise from the horizontal portion or the vertical portion of the vertebral artery at the V3 level. It means that even when you are performing the initial step of the procedure, the pica can be at risk. Just one thing that has also to be detected preparatively, the posterior arch cannot be completely closed in some circumstances. So just be aware of this situation. So as I told you before, the posterior lateral approach is mainly dedicated for intradural lesions and posterior extradural lesions. Regarding intradural lesions, the most common one are the foramen magnum meningiomas. This is the classification of Bernard Georges. Most of the foramen magnum meningiomas are intradural, posterolateral, and among the lateral one, what is important is the relation with the vertebral artery. It's important to know that because depending on the relation between the meningioma and the vertebral artery, you can anticipate the position of the lower cranial nerves. If the vertebral artery is above, meaning the tumor is below, then you'll be sure that the lower cranial nerves are pushed with the arachnoid at the upper level of the tumor. It means the dissection is safer. On the other hand, if the tumor is above the vertebral artery, which is displaced caudally, then the position of the lower cranial nerve cannot be anticipated, as well as the tumor grows on both sides of the vertebral artery. So this posterior lateral approach is surely dedicated for 95% of the foramen magnum meningiomas. Also, as I said, for posterior extradural lesions, this is a neurofibroma extending at the level of the C1, C2. No need to resect any bone. What is interesting is that, com contrarily to the subaxial level, the neurofibromas at the C1, C2 level are developed posteriorly to the joints. It means that through a posterior lateral approach, there is no need to touch the joint and to create any instability. In this situation, the tumor is in close relation with the vertebral artery and was responsible for an occipital neuralgia. 
very disturbing occipital neuralgia, and it is how it looks at surgery. C1 is here, C2 is here. The tumor is at this level, <coughs> anteriorly to the C2 nerve root. The sheet is open, the tumor is removed. And you can uh, attend here. At the end, you will see the vertebral artery when the tumor is completely resected. So the posterior, posterior approach is well dedicated for this kind of tumor, as well as for dumbbell-shaped tumor extending intradurally with, in this situation, uh, the need to open the dura and have a more complex procedure in order to have, at the end, watertight closure of the dura. But the risk remains low by this approach. Of course, this posterior approach is well dedicated for bone tumors, posteriorly located bone tumors, that is the approach that has to be used. Just to show you one special case of patient suffering again of occipital neuralgia in relation to a severe osteoarthritis, degenerative osteoarthritis at this level, operated on by a posterior lateral approach, you see how the osteophyte go close to the vertebral artery, which is located here. This is C1 transverse process, you will see C2 here. This is the offending process, the C2 nerve root, which is mobilized, the offending process, which is removed, releasing the C2 uh, nerve root with a great success. The patient was completely pain-free at the end uh, and for a long-term follow-up. At this, in this situation, there, were, there was no movement, preoperative movement of the C1, C2 joint, and we place a fixation. So, those are the details regarding the posterior lateral approach. Now I will move to the anterior lateral approach, which is a little different and is well dedicated for anterior extradural lesion at the craniocervical junction level, also to approach the jugular foramen. What is the difference? The incision is here made along the medial border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle, as it is used for exposing the vertebral artery at the V2 level or even V1. The incision turn along the mastoid process towards the external protuber uh, occipital protuberance. What is important is that we leave in place a cuff of five millimeter of muscle in order to reapproximate at the end of the surgery when dividing the muscle, the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Retracting the muscle laterally will allow to continue the dissection to expose the lateral border of the internal jugular vein. What is important to know is that the 11 coronary nerve is crossing the field and has to be respected during the approach. The target point of the, this approach is the C1 transverse process that can be palpated one centimeter below the mastoid tip. And targeting this point is crucial because at this level, the vertebral artery is protected by the bone of the C1 transverse process. So you work safely if you target first this area. Just one point that can be also detected as variation is when the groove above the C1 posterior arch is turned into a tunnel, this situation is a little more difficult if you have to transpose the vertebral artery. So transposition of the vertebral artery is well dedicated to access extradural lesions, but in this situation, no anteriorly located. You see, it is the level of the uh, lateral mass of C1. Regarding some technical points, you have to know, and it is truly crucial, that the anatomy depends on the head position. If you look on this view, which is a neutral position, both segments below C1 and above C1 are in fact perpendicular. But as soon as you move the head and you turn the head, and by sample in this situation, turning the head to the right, the left transverse process is pushed with the head anteriorly meaning as much as you turn the head, as much as both segments above and below C1 becomes more and more parallel. It completely changed the anatomical relation at this level. And it's important to know how to place the patient according, that, according to the area that you would like to reach and where is located the tumor. You also see that 
when you just make a CT scan and when the head is turned, you see that the vertebral artery, which is located in the C1, the bone of the C1 transverse foramen, will move anteriorly. So, and this is the situation when the patient is placed supine. So those are the anatomical relation that you will have depending on the head position. Another aspect that we have to discuss is when to perform a balloon occlusion test. It will depend first of the size of the vertebral artery. If the vertebral artery is a minor one, just again, as I told you before, we have just to exclude the termination into a pica. You can detect that on an angio MR or an angio CT. It's not mandatory to make uh, an angiography, uh, even it depicts uh, much more easily the situation. When the vertebral arteries are equivalent, or if you have to approach the dominant vertebral arteries, you have not to perform in all cases a balloon occlusion test, but only when there is a risk of vertebral artery injury during the procedure. If the risk is slow, you have nothing to do, no balloon occlusion test. If the risk is high, then a balloon occlusion test is advised. And of course, you have to preserve the vertebral artery. Injuring the vertebral artery is quite an uncommon condition, but preparatively, it is advised to perform a balloon occlusion test if the risk is high. And when the risk is high, it is when there is a severe compression of the artery, when there is a complete encasement, if the tumor is suspected to be malignant, if the patient has already been irradiated or operated on. In those five circumstances, in case of dominant of equivalent vertebral artery, it is better to perform a balloon occlusion test preoperatively. So as I told you before, the target point is the C1 transverse process when you perform an anterolateral approach. In this location, the vertebral artery is protected by bone. Then again, it is the same principle of performing a superosteal dissection in order to leave in place the superosteal, the superosteum along the artery. And when you do that from laterally to medially, from inferiorly to superiorly, then you will mobilize easily the vertebral artery. You will open the C1 transverse foramen. And after the dissection of the periosteum inside the foramen, you can transpose the vertebral artery. And transposing the vertebral artery will give you an access to the anterior structures. Of course, when you treat a patient of a tumor, it's always better to try to obtain a proximal and distal control. A variety of uh, pathologies can be treated with transposition of the vertebral artery, bone tumor, and there is a, a huge variety of bone tumor, either primary bone tumor or secondary one. Again, the surgical technique is to try to obtain a vessel control on both sides of the tumor. You have to think about the spinal stability, which is a preoperative concern. Normally, your surgery should not induce a postoperative instability if it is not present preoperatively. And what is crucial is the extent of resection, because the prognosis of bone tumor is in relation with the completeness of the resection. This tumor by sample located in the occipital condyle was a plasmocytoma. You see how it looks during an anterolateral approach. You see the loop of the V3 segment of the vertebral artery, the C2 nerve root crossing the field. If you would like to transpose the vertebral artery, the C2 nerve root has to be sacrificed. Superstial dissection, transposition of the vertebral artery, and then drilling the condyle in order to remove the lesion. And at the end, you see the 12 cranial nerve. Another tumor, a giant cell tumor, again, the same principle. And it was uh, this image I showed you before. In order to access to this tumor, you have to transpose the vertebral artery. And when the artery is transposed, then you can obtain an access to remove this tumor. In this situation, the tumor recurred a few years after. And at that time, the vertebral artery was sacrificed because it was too difficult to reoperate without sacrificing the vertebral artery. Sacrifice was well tolerated and a fixation was made during this uh, second step surgery. We often encounter at the cranial cervical junction uh, chordomas. The other speaker will speak about that. This is a chordomas located in C2 extending into C3 on the dominant side of the vertebral artery, you see the lateral approach, just to show you the reconstruction at the end with the distractible cage placed from a lateral approach with a uniplate, meaning a plate placed from a lateral approach with only two screws, which provide enough stabilization. 
More than bone tumors, this, uh, this approach is useful to access the jugular foramen for jugular and foramen tumors, but also parapharyngeal tumors and soft tissue tumor. This is uh, peripheral nerve sheet tumors, uh, a, sh a schwannoma extending from the posterior fossa towards the cervical region, again, resected to, through this uh, anterolateral approach. This is a case of liposarcoma surrounding the craniocervical junction, again, resected by an anterolateral approach. In some circumstances, both approach, anterolateral and posterior one, can be combined. This is a patient with a special situation already operated on for a fixation elsewhere uh, in relation with the thyroid carcinoma, the fixation broke, the patient was tetraparetic, and you see how uh, the angle of kyphosis was severe at that time. So the patient was operated first through a posterior approach to remove the material, exposition of the V3 segment above C1. You see some muscular branches, which are as arising from the vertebral artery. You see then the lateral approach with transposition of the vertebral artery and through this lateral approach with section through C1 and C2 of the dens, of what, what remains from the dens, then the patient is again placed prone to perform a correct fixation, extended fixation. And then you see how the kyphosis is corrected with this combined approach. This combined approach was also used uh, for this young patient, six year old. This is a giant cell tumor. You see the situation 22 October and six weeks later, you see how the tumor was growing. The tumor was preparatively embolized. Through the lateral approach, the component which is laterally located was resected. You can see a graft placed in the resection of C2, graft which is completely integrated after a few months. And then through a posterior approach, the remnant of the tumor is removed and the posterior stabilization is performed with complete resection at the end and a long-term follow-up, which is uh, very good. So this is my conclusion. You see, there are several ways to approach the craniocervical junction, the anterior approach, the posterior -lateral approach, and the anterolateral one. All those approaches have their advantages, disadvantages, their particularities that have to be known. And I have tried to explain you how to manage the vertebral artery at uh, this level when you have to expose the vertebral artery. Thank you. I have stopped to share my screen. Maybe we can move to the second speaker. And if you have some question, uh, we can uh, answer at the end if it is okay for you. So the second speaker is you, Daniel Roy. Please, yes, yes. Roy, it's getting... a pleasure to listen to you for the organization of the muscle at this level. It will be for sure complementary to my talk. And uh, you... Yeah, just, I'm just getting my presentation up. Nice. Anatomical relation of the hypoclosal canal are also very relevant. So, can you see my screen? Not yet. Share screen. Stop. Doesn't work, Daniel. Just uh, trying security. Come back. Otherwise, if you have some difficulties, we can move to the talk of uh, Jan Frederick about the. Yeah, okay. Why don't you go ahead? I'll try to fix it. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, Please, Jan. So, can you see my yeah. screen now? Uh, it, yes, it's visible, please, Jan. Okay, so hello, everybody, also from my side. Good afternoon. I'm going um, to say some words about the stabilization strategies um, at the cervical junctions. Um, so I will start with the indications and then talk a bit about the biomechanics. So what is... Uh, 
instability and also another issue which also which often raises is uh, how much can we drill the condyle and then how should we fix that i will talk about the different screw types and the post operative concerns and then conclude so cryocervical junction surgery is a very interesting mixture in fact of skull base surgery vascular surgery and complex spine surgery. So I think you have to be proficient in all of these domains. And this is what makes this area so interesting. So um, today I'm going to talk about the main indications in, in tumor cases and in iatrogenic cases. Um, so if the condyla is resected as part of a surgery, as has already been mentioned by Mikael and of course, there are a lot of other indications like trauma or degenerative pathology, infections, congenital malformations with um, supplementary bones like the os odontoidium or others. And uh, formerly, there was also a quite pretty uh, often an indication in uh, rheumatoid arthritis, but this now has become a quite obsolete because of the good medical treatments that are provided. So when we talk about uh, stabilization, so we, we first have to define what is instability. So when we're talking about instability in a, a tumor patient, um, it's useful to know this score, the spinal instability neoplastic score, the SINS score. So it's composed of different items and the range is from 0 to 18. And so if you are in this range here, 0 to 6, the situation is considered stable. And if you are in this range, 13 to 18, it's considered unstable. And if you are in this intermediate range between 7 and 12, you um, at least have to think about um, uh, the need of stabilization. So if we are looking here in, 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 in the details or in the items, if we go for the cranial cervical junction, so there's a regional um, factor here, three points, pain, three points, and then the type of uh, lesions of the, of the bone and other um, radiological uh, factors. And then we add them up and may have an idea about the stability. Then there are a lot of lines that you can draw at the level of the cranial junction with normal values. And there are intervals between the clivus and the dens, or here between the uh, atlas and the axis. And there are also here the, the power ratio, which are indicative of spinal um, stability or instability when reading the plane x-rays or the CT scan. So now the second issue, so that was raised, so how much condyle can we drill when performing the surgery? So this is an interesting review that investigated the cervical stability after condylectomy. So there are different types of studies that were reviewed. So there were the cadaver studies, and it turned out that up to 75 of the condyle, 75% of the condyle may be resected um, without resulting in significant instability. If we're looking to the clinical studies, so there, 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 there is a whole bunch of studies here and the um, resection, the degree of resection varies between 30 and 50%. So all in all a bit below the um, cadaver studies. So the stability is somewhere in this range. So which kind of fixations do we have at the um, cervical junction? So if we have the occipital condyle or the C1 region involved, then we have something which spans the um, occipital cervical junction. So going from the occiput to the cervical spine. If we have a, um, a more regional problem, so often the other indication that I mentioned, trauma, degenerative, malformation, then often it's enough to just do a fixation between the atlas and the axis. So this is an interesting algorithm. So it's um, 
and all about the uh, deform deformity. So one of the first important questions is if the um, deformity is reducible, yes or no. If it's reducible, it may be sufficient just to do a um, reduction and do a posterior stabilization. If it's not reducible, then it depends on the uh, focus of the patho pathology. If it's a ventral compression in, in, in the uh, rheumatoid arthritis with the penis, then it may be enough just to do a reduction and a posterior fixation and the panels will re, um, recover or regress um, by itself after a couple of months. If we have bony deformity like an osphododridium or a degenerative uh, problem, then the uh, posterior fixation is not enough because the ventral compression may not disappear after some months. Then uh, ventral decompression either by a transoral or nowadays more by a transnasal endoscopic approach will be necessary. If, on the other hand, the problem is uh, located at the, um, at the facets, then it depends on the degree of the deformity. So if there is only a mild um, deformity, it may be enough just to perform a C1, C2 fixation. And if it's more severe and you need uh, also a chronocervical realignment, then you may have um, to take uh, occipital cervical fixation. So a lot of things about anatomy were already mentioned by uh, in the talk of uh, Michael. So here just um, two or three important points. So we are, we need to put our screws or material here in this region. We have the vertebral artery, we have the nerve roots, we have the um, spinal cord. And what is one first thing that is important is to, of course, to be aware of the course of the vertebral artery. And then it's important to know that there are a lot of uh, anomalies also. So there, they may be uh, anomalous uh, courses and the artery may course at places where we want to put our screws. Another thing that was well explained by Michael is the uh, fact that the, um, the, the course of the vertebral artery depends on head position. So if you have the, 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 the head, uh, if you have, uh, this is left side, so if the head turns, the, um, the, the course around the atlas here becomes in such a way here, uh, the, the segment is vertical. The two segments are vertical, and the more you turn the head, the more the, those two segments become parallel. So this is something that you have to be aware of. And uh, when talking about these anom uh, anomalies, it's uh, very useful to study a preoperative uh, CT and a CTA. And then you, you may find, uh, like here, a uh, first uh, intersegmental artery or a fenestrated vertebral artery. And these both uh, malformations or vascular anomalies um, um, course, have a course of the artery right at the place where you want to put a C1 screw. Other anomalies are, for example, an extracranial or an extradural peak uptake. Then you might have um, osseous anomalies like here, you, you have, might have a high riding vertebral artery. So this is a very shallow pedicle here of the C2 um, uh, vertebra. So this is something that you have to be aware of. So uh, it's very important to do a meticulous um, analysis of the preoperative CT and CTA. And of course, you can have a combination of osseous and um, vascular anomalies. So um, one thing that is very important is to evaluate the um, dimensions of the C2 pedicle. So if you want to put a screw here in the C2 pedicle, one thing is to evaluate the height. The height of the um, C2 pedicle should be at least four millimeters because most of the screws have a diameter of four millimeters and this might be evaluated here in a sagittal CT scan. But you have also to evaluate the width of the pedicle. So if you want to put a screw here, you want to avoid laterally the vertebral artery and medially um, the um, spinal canal. So what is very useful is if you have a thin cut 
CT and in, again in coronal views. And then you go from medial to lateral. And so here the bone starts. And so you have two millimeters, four millimeters, six millimeters. And here you start to see the um, foramen of the vertebral artery. So you have at least three, two millimeter slides, six millimeters of width of this structure. So if you have a pedicle that is more than six millimeter wide, then it's considered a low risk situation. If you have a pedicle between four and six, it's an intermediate risk. And if you have a pedicle below four millimeter in, in wide width, then it's a high risk situation. So if you calculate the event that you have a bilateral low risk of a uh, um, uh, bilateral low risk situation is only about 10%. So if you have a high risk situation, so again, uh, um, the width of the pedicle lower than four millimeter, then it may be safer to put either a pass screw or lamina screw. So here are the screw types at the level of the occiput, you have bicortical screws. Here at the level of the atlas, you have, uh, or you have um, muscle lateralis screws. So here in, at the level of the C2 vertebra, you have the most variation, so you, you may have pedicle screws, such as I explained. If it's too unsafe, you may also put pass screws, which are a bit shorter and do not pass the vertebral artery, or you may even put some um, lamina screws. And for the other levels below the subaxial spine, so you have muscle lateralis screws. So what is very important when performing an occipital cranial um, fixation is the patient positioning. You have to put your patient in a prone position. The head is held by a Mayfield holder. And it's very important to, um, to look at the horizontal gaze because one, once the patient is fixed, it, uh, it may be um, uh, very difficult for this patient to, to have an uh, horizontal gaze if the occiput is fixed in a way that the horizontal the, the gaze line is is uh, is uh, hanging downwards. So the exposure is 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 pretty simple. Midline exposure. You want to expose the um, osseous structures, occiput C1, C2, the facets, and the um, the artery. But usually you don't really see the course of the artery, but you have with a good overview or at least of the bony landmarks, then you may use or must use intraoperative tools, at least um, fluoroscopy or maybe even uh, intraoperative CT. And most of the cases we would also use or recommend the use of intraoperative neuromonitoring. So this is just uh, as illustration, interesting um, case, case report, where the, uh, in this case, they, the surgeons performed uh, um, a destruction and then there, there was disappearance here of the motor evoke potentials and after partial release, the um, motor evoke potentials recovered. So this is very important because it may indicate a potentially dangerous but reversible situation during surgery. So where do we put our um, occipital plane? So the thickest bone is here at the level of the nuchal line and below the occipital protuberance. So at these levels, the bone is thickest. This is shown here again. So here at the level of the superior nuchal line and here in the midline below the occipital protuberance. So the uh, we start with a drill about eight to 10 millimeters with a drill guide. And then we probe the occiput and then we increase the length of the drill by two millimeters increments. And we want to have a bicortical purchase. Then the first screw is placed on the midline and then the other screws, which should be a bit shorter in length are positioned laterally. So this was for the occiput, for the C1 screws. If you have a large posterior arch, you may drill through the posterior arch of C1 here in the, in the midline. The trajectory is a bit upward 
orientated to aim at the inferior part of the anterior tubercle and the direction is pretty straightforward. If you have a smaller arch, which is uh, like here, you may need to, uh, to notch the posterior arch and then the direction and the insertion of the screw is pretty the same. So you should tap and screw on under fluor fluoroscopic guidance and the length is measured or was defined on the preoperative imaging. So some pitfalls are um, avulsion or lesion of the C2 root, which passes below the arch of the posterior arch of Atlas. And another thing is that this region is uh, highly vascularized with an venous plexus. So you need to do a careful subperiostal dissection in order to avoid very yes, heavy venous bleedings. So for the C2 pedicle screw, the entry point is about two millimeter lateral to the midpoint of the joint. And then in the lateral trajectory, it's parallel to the, um, to the upper border of the pedicle. You want to remain pretty in the upper port of the C2 um, pedicle. And the length is something 20, 22, 24 millimeters. The direction is converging. For the C2 lamina screws, which is a more safe option, you may enter here at the upper part of the, um, of the spinous process and uh, put your first screw in the, in, in, in the one lamina, and then you um, make an entry point just below on the other side, and then you put your second screw here like crosswise. So for the muscle lateralis screws, there are a lot of um, entry points and directions that have been described. We think that this is at least in our hands, the safest way of putting in muscle lateralis screws. So we have the uh, facet, we, we, we have a cross, and then the entry point is a bit above and immediately of the intersection of those lines. And then we aim laterally and in an upward direction. So this is pretty safe to avoid the vertebral artery, which is here, and also to avoid the nerve roots, nerve roots with, which are exiting here at this level. So which is also important after having put in the screws is you have to decorticate the bone and then put some cancellous bone in order to obtain a good fusion. So these are a lot of different types of occipital cervical fusions that have been described over the time. But nowadays we would recommend and use uh, um, a system which is made of, of, diff of, of plates and screws and watch rods, which uh, will guarantee a fusion rate of more than 95%. So what are the complications? General surgical complication, then specific to the hardware that you are putting, hardware malpositioning, breaking, loosening, and then injury of the, um, the, the vessels or nervous structures, or the problem of non-fusion after several months or week. So important is to make an X-ray just after the mobilization. So usually we do that on day one or day two, and then we do another X-ray about two or three months post-surgery, just to um, make sure that we are not in this kind of situation with the loosening of the screws. So post-operative consideration, patients may uh, stand up or sit and walk after surgery. Um, bracing is usually, we do not use it anymore. Patient may be discharged when he is um, stable and the uh, follow up with X-rays, as I just said. And if we consider surgery um, or radiation therapy after surgery, we uh, think that um, we should wait at least for two weeks if we're going for a radio surgery and um, longer interval, two to four weeks if we are doing a conventional radiotherapy. therapy. So this is my conclusion. So we talked about the indications for stabilizations at the cryosurgical 
junction, we defined what is instability. We talked about different types of fixation. Uh, we um, highlighted the um, careful analysis of preoperative imaging. We talked about the surgical technique and the postoperative care. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jan, uh, for this uh, complete overview of uh, the techniques to fix the occipital cervical junction. So, uh, Roy. Yeah, I'm trying. Uh, yes, maybe Jan, if you can stop to share your screen. Yes. But thank you, Jan. And, can you uh, see my screen now? Um, yes, my... yes, it's possible to see your screen, uh, Roy. Please. Uh, uh, thank you, um, uh, Michael, for. Uh, uh, organizing this and I'm happy you spoke about the anterolateral approaches. I would like so that there's not much of uh, an overlap between uh, my talk and yours and possibly Sebastian's at the end. Uh, I'm focusing on just the anatomy of the foramen magnum and CV junction from a posterolateral perspective. And this is work entirely done in our lab, uh, in our cadaver lab here at, uh, here at Lausanne. So it'll, the talk goes through this, the organization of the muscles, uh, focusing after that on the bony anatomy, the occipital condyle, the jugular foramen, the hypoglossal canal, and in between, of course, the neurovascular uh, anatomy. So uh, the, uh, the, the head and the upper cervical spine have to deal with a particular problem. It has uh, to deal with large head movements, and therefore the articular surfaces uh, uh, are modified and they also have at the same time to protect neurovascular uh, structures. So these are the bones that we are looking at, the occipital bone, the C1 and the uh, C1 and the C2. Uh, if you look at the occipital bone, it's got a, a squamosal part and then it's got the lateral parts and the basilar part, which is inclined at about 45 degrees and represents what is the inferior clivus. And look at it from interior, you have these impressions of the of the transverse uh, sinuses. You have the jugular notch anteriorly, a uh, little more anterior and the basilar part right in front and that encloses the foramen magnum. Now look at it from underneath, it's, you have the C0, which is the oxygen content, which is caudally convex and it contains the important structure, which is the hypoglossal canal, which is a part, a major part of this presentation. Now, if you look at the, from the undersurface, you'll see the hypoglossal canal located very anteriorly here, the external part of it. And that is the foramen magnum that you see there. You turn it a little oblique, you can see on the contralateral side, the hypoglossal canal internally, which sometimes can be double. And there you have an important landmark, which is the condylar fossa, which is just superior and uh, or to the condyle, which assumes importance in surgeries of this region. Now, it's also important to understand the variations of the occipital condyle in approaches that involve uh, drilling the occipital condyle. So they're very often oval in shape in about 60%. It can have multiple, multiple shapes, circular, like an eight triangle kidney, you name it, it exists. And some of them can even be two portioned, which is very, very rare. So it's important to see that on a pre-op image, especially when you're doing uh, transcondylar approaches. I'd like to focus on the anatomy of the hypoglossal canal within the uh, uh, occipital condyle, and it is oriented at approximately 45 degrees like this from, from inside out. And, uh, and to find the occipital canal when you start drilling it, you need to expect it at about eight millimeters uh, uh, anterior to the posterior end of the occipital condyle. And if you look at it supero inferiorly, you'll find it five millimeters from the inferior edge. Now, this, this is a study that I'll be showing you in which you find that the internal occipital, uh, internal part of the uh, hypoglossal canal uh, is always at the middle third of the condyle, while the anterior uh, anterior third of the condyle has the external part of the uh, uh, of the hypoglossal canal. So that's an important consideration to see, and this can be seen from this study, which shows that it's almost always in the anterior third extracranially, and almost always in the middle third uh, internally. The hypoglossal canal also are of several types, and you could see it could be a single canal in the majority, but sometimes you have 
osseous bridging and double canal. So various morphologies are possible and this needs to be clearly recognized on a preoperative uh, CT. Another important structure that needs to be seen and identified is the condylar vein. It is because it is what leads you to the anatomy of this region. So the posterior condylar emissary vein is an important structure that needs to be seen on the image and during surgery. So the most common type is the posterior condylar emissary vein that joins the sigmoid sinus. So that's the most common type. And then you have the jugular bulb type, you have the occipital sinus type, it joins occipital sinus. The anterior one is never a consideration because the anterior uh, condylar emissary vein is away from our field, so it's less of a concern for a posterolateral approach. Now, in, why is it important? Because when you do a posterolateral approach, you come to the vein and it gives you a marking because it's always above the occipital condyle and, it, and it's better to identify it because it can give serious bleeding if you don't identify it. And in any case, it should not be avulse from its uh, origin uh, to the jugular, jugular vein or the sigmoid sinus. And it's always found immediately superior to the hypoglossal canal. So this is one of our patients. You find a very large posterior uh, condylar vein. And here you can see the, this is superior here and that's lateral. So that's the vertebral artery and the venous plexus around. And you have an extremely large condylar posteriorly placed going to the, to the sigmoid sinus. Another important structure in this region is the jugular foramen. And that you find uh, here in, in this slice, which is supero inferior, that is the interlottery canal here. And then you have the jugular foramen. Superior is this side. And you find the jugular tubercle here. And if you look at uh, uh, x rays, uh, uh, CT scans of uh, a coronal view, you'll find the jugular tubercle, which is like the American eagle uh, on its outside part. The jugular foramen in itself is divided into two, in not very intuitively the names, but the anterior part is the pars nervosa. It's got the ninth nerve in it and the inferior petrosal sinus. And the pars vascularis, though it is vascular because of the jugular vein, also has the 10 and the 11 within it. So in a transverse scan, you will find very often a jugular spine that divides these two compartments. Now this is a, these are this is these are pictures from Roten's collection, and you see if you remove the jugular vein, you'll find the entry point of all the nerves, the 9, 10, 11 here, uh, exiting the jugular foramen, and then the twelfth in the uh, in the hypoglossal canal, and they all join extracranially here, behind the vertebral artery and in, uh, and between the vertebral and the, the carotid in front. So it has got an intimate relationship, these four nerves with the carotid artery and the internal jugular vein. So the atlas uh, is sim slightly simpler to understand. It's ring-shaped. Uh, it has no body and uh, no spinous processes. It's, the anterior arch is very small. The posterior arch is pretty long. But this is the most important part, and, uh, part, and uh, Michael, uh, Michael also stressed on this because it tells you where the vertebral artery is in, in these kind of approaches because that's what protects you from the vertebral artery. And once you locate it, you know where you see the vertebral artery. So the, it is, this is the upper surface of the C1 lateral mass, and this is where it articulates to the C0, and that's, you can see it is cordially convex. The important part, as discussed before, is the transverse process, which covers the vertebral artery foramen. So this is a study we did many years back of patients who, uh, who we treated for congenital CV junction anomalies is about 170 arteries. And it's important, these arteries need to be classified, especially in people with congenital craniovertebral junction anomalies. So type uh, one is the one in which the artery goes below the C1 arch. And this almost always occurs when the C1 arch is occipitalized. So it can be present with a transverse foramen present or a transverse foramen absent. And then you have arteries that enter through a canal in C0, C1. Uh, and then other types is arteries that enter the dura above the C1 posterior arch with or without uh, transverse foramen. And then you have the normal artery or an absent artery. Just to show you some examples, this is type one where the artery goes below the C1 arch and you can either have a foramen that makes it type A or type B. And then this is type two where the, art, uh, where the artery goes anterior to the lateral mass or posterior to the lateral mass or through the lateral mass. So different examples 
of variations that can happen in this situation. And then you have uh, the artery that goes, uh, the normal artery that goes, uh, that is type four, and uh, uh, it, uh, it goes above C1, but uh, the transverse foramen is absent, which is type three. So these are rarer variants. One of the important uh, variants that you could find, though it is quite, could be quite common, actually five to 20% is extradural origin of the pica. And that's important to know from a preoperative imaging and during surgery, because you can injure it and, uh, and create a problem. And sometimes it can even be double. So an extradural origin of the pica is something to be looked out for. When you look at a posterior approach or a posterior lateral approach, you need to look at the posterior dissection landmarks, the midline, the, uh, the external occipital protuberance that tells you where the, where the torcula is. And of course the C2 uh, spinous process, which can be easily palpated. Uh, there are two variations of the approaches for the posterolateral approach to this region. The classical uh, neurosurgical uh, use is the one that goes midline and uh, turns around and that Michael showed you already where the muscles are all moved uh, as a bulk. I'm not really focusing on that because that's very well known uh, in neurosurgical uh, community. What I'm really focusing on is the other variation, which is sometimes called the extreme posterolateral approach in which uh, the muscles have to be identified individually and transposed uh, medially. So this is this, these are dissections done in our laboratory. And that is when you just open the skin, you see a bunch of muscles in the skin, which are the occipital muscles. That's your mastered process. This is superior here. This is inferior here. The trapezius and the sternocleidomastoid. There are a few nerves that uh, are reasonably um, regular uh, 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 its measurements. So you have the greater <laughs> occipital nerve, the lesser occipital nerve, uh, and the great auricular nerve. So these are nerves that are fairly constant in its location. Just show you quick videos that uh, show you the organization of the muscles. So these are the muscles, but they're organized into four layers. They're organized into four layers. So the first layer is what you're seeing on the screen and that's your sternocleidomastoid, which is attached to the superior nuchal line mastoid process and goes to the sternum and clavicle. And as soon as uh, you, you move that, you'll see a very large muscle, which is the second layer, the splenius capitis, which comes from the mastoid process and goes uh, medially. Again, they're all attached to the superior nuchal line and the mastoid process here, inferiorly. And then as you move uh, that muscle, you come to two important muscles, which represent the third layer. There you see the third layer, which is the longissimus from the mastoid and going to the C5 to T3 and the semi-spinalis from the superior nuclear, nuclear line that goes to the, the, the thoracic vertebrae there, all the way up to the thoracic after the cervical. So these are the, this is the third layer. Now, after you remove uh, or deflect the, the third layer, you come to the important part of the dissection where you see the famous uh, suboccipital triangle uh, and there you see these three important muscles. So the first muscle is the rectus capitis posterior and you have the minor here, which is not related directly, but that's the rectus capitis uh, major. And then you have these two obliques, uh, both of which are attached to the, to the C1 transverse process. So the superior oblique here and the inferior oblique here. And that encloses the superior uh, suboccipital triangle. And there you can see a glimpse of the of the vertebral artery there. So in this patient, you can see this, uh, the cadaver, you can see this is medial, this is lateral, and that's your vertebral artery. And almost always you will have uh, uh, a muscular branch there. As long as it's not a pica and going inside, it can be taken. So these muscular branches are fairly constant, you find them, and that's where it enters uh, into the dura. That's where it comes out from the transverse process. Right, so that's the image that you would get. And just to summarize this, you have, this is midline here. This is the Atlanta occipital membrane. That's the atlas just on one side, C1. That's the hemi atlas. That's the lateral mass of atlas. And superiorly, you have the rectus capitis lateralis, which actually protects the jugular foramen. 
And below it, you have the levator scapulae, which uh, protects the carotid and the, the jugular vein anterior to it. And that's your vertebral artery here. Some muscular branches you can see. This is vertebral below C2, C1, and this is vertebral artery above C1. That's the, the C2 uh, nerve root, the ganglion, and the dorsal and the ventral uh, rami. So we'll continue with the dissection. This is after uh, lateral suboxyl craniectomy and half of the C1 arch that's removed. You can see the inferior part of the sigmoid sinus. And there you see the vertebral artery that's been mobilized and that's where it's entering into the dura medially. That's where it's coming through the transverse process which has been opened in this case. There are a few muscular branches here. And there we have removed it outside. We've opened the jugular foramen as well so that you can see outside. Uh, the structures outside the nerves and the vessels, and that's your C0, C1 joint. Now, it's important to realize that there are two layers of dura, as you know, in the, in the brain, uh, in the skull base, and it separates into two to enclose the vertebral artery, along with it, the, uh, the vertebral venous plexus. So it is just like the cavernous sinus that you find anteriorly. So you have another cavernous sinus posteriorly in the posterior fossa outside, and in the important difference being that there are no important nerves within it. So you have only sensory nerves, so you could be a little more aggressive with it. But as long as you keep uh, one dural layer intact, so if you do a subperiosteal dissection, you can avoid the bleeding from all these vertebral venous uh, plexus. So we'll continue with the video to show the drilling towards of the occipital condyle. There you see the lateral mass here, that's your occipital condyle, and that's the condylar fossa. Just as a reminder, again, this is the drilling that we want to do. That's your jugular foramen and the hypoglossal canal, so it is oblique, and the drilling area is this medial part that you want to drill, and you follow the cancellous part till you reach, of course, with monitoring, the cortical part, which is, should be found somewhere here for the hypoglossal canal. So that's your hypoglossal canal. And above it, you can keep drilling the jugular uh, process uh, till the jugular tubercle there. Uh, so that gives you 180, at least 180 degrees of opening of the hypoglossal canal. So there you can see the open jugular foramen there to follow the structures of the jugular foramen. And there you, that's the extracranial hypoglossal nerve, which is in continuity through the canal here. Right. So once you open the dura here of this region, you see the interesting structures. And because of the condylar approach, you have uh, quite a lateral axis. That's the seventh, eighth, the fifth, the ninth, tenth, there, pica loop here. That's your impression of the rest of the jugular tubercle. You see the 11th nerve that goes back in the spinal accessory to go through the canal. When you go anterior to that, you see a nerve that goes to the dural lobe. That's nerve six to the dural lobe. And that is above, you go above the seventh and eighth and you see the fifth nerve. If you come inferiorly, that's your projection of the hypoglossal canal. You can see the rootlets of the hypoglossal. There were double rootlets that were going post, always posterior to the, to the vertebral artery and superior to the dentate ligament. So just a, a reminder, there are two ways of moving the flap. And it's important when you do the flap in this direction, when you move it laterally, uh, sorry, medially, you need to have a very clear understanding of the muscular anatomy of the region. So just some quick, uh, quickly some examples. This is a foramen magnum meningioma that you do the standard neurosurgical approach, no individual muscle delineation operated in the in the lateral position, uh, and that's your suboccipital um, uh, dura. And the vertebral artery we had identified before here, extradurally, and you open uh, the dura to release the CSF. And this patient is in the lateral position, so the brainstem and the cervical cord is usually kept almost completely uh, covered by dura. I'll show you that. So that's your cistern, which is opening the cerebellomedullary cisterns that gives a lot of relaxation. And there you see the tumor. And uh, if you take stitches onto the uh, denticulate ligament here, you can, you can actually rotate the cord a little bit. That's your intradural vertebral artery. That's your stitch on the dentate ligament. And that actually 
covers the entire uh, neural structures there, uh, the, the end of the brainstem and the upper cervical cord and, and the tumor there. So the removal of the tumor is uh, like standard meningioma, um, uh, removal, debulking, detaching from its attachment and uh, a total removal. And at the end, uh, you cut the ligament, uh, the stitch on the denticulate ligament, it brings it back, and then you can see the cervical cord uh, that comes back into view. So that's fairly simple. It gives very good results. Now, this is a case of a brainstem cavernoma and prolateral. So we decided to mobilize the vertebral artery. So this, again, is in the lateral position. That's the vertebral artery you have uh, exposed below C1 that's below C1, that's the transverse foramen, which is opened here, that's the vertebral artery above uh, C1, and you can transpose it medially. And once you transpose it medially, it gives access to uh, the, the lateral masses of C1, C2, and the occipital condyle. Now, the advantage of this is that you can remove the entire one third of this huge lateral pillar. When you remove that, it gives you a lot of space to put the vertebral back into it. That gives you a much more anterior origin. So anterior axis. So the vertebral artery is pushed back into that bony defect, and then the dura is opened around the vertebral artery to give access to the anterolateral surface of the brainstem to give access to the removal of the, the cavernoma. There you see the pica loop, the cavity of the resection, and you can almost always completely close it. So closure is never a problem. If you want a little more anterior exposure, of course, you can open the dura anterior to the vertebral artery, but then closure becomes a, a little more difficult. This gives you excellent access to the anterolateral part of the stem in this region. So I'd like to conclude by saying that the anatomy of this region, the bone anatomy and the ligamentous anatomy has to allow large head movements. And therefore the ligaments and the muscle systems are little particular in comparison to other areas. And two major movements flexion extension at C01 and rotation at C12. The anatomy, neurovascular anatomy is complicated, but uh, the anatomy of the jugular foramen and hypoglossal canal is key. The vertebral artery management is of course key and don't forget the large venous spaces uh, uh, around it. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Roy, for this uh, nice anatomical overview and the description of your two cases. So it's time to move to you, Henri, and uh, we will uh, listen to a very interesting talk I expect on uh, craniocervical junction chordomas. Please, Henri. Yeah, thanks, Michael. It was an invitation. <laughs> so can you see my slide? Yes. It's moving? Yes. Okay, so I, I just want to show some examples of chordomas, which, um, which frequently involve the lower clivus and the cranial vertebral junction. And this makes it a little bit more difficult. When we look at the literature, it shows that the rate of cross total resection is the predictor of the progression-free survival. So the aim is always in these chordomas, if possible, to get a gross total resection. Unfortunately, in the lower clavicle codomas, this is frequently not possible. <clears throat> but even if you get a gross total resection of the codoma, usually it's recommended to make a proton beam radiation or the carbon ion radiation. And there is a study from Heidelberg showing that the oral survival in after 10 years when you have a combination of resection and radiation can go up to 75%, which is quite good. But is radiation always safe? Of course not. This is one case who underwent carbon ion radiation. And you see there is a severe necrosis in the central part of the brain after radiation with damage to both furnaces so that the patient has severe memory problems. So the endoscopic endonasal approach is an ideal approach for chordomas because these usually arise in the midline and displace all the nerves laterally. So instead of coming from lateral and you have all the nerves in your way, you come from the medial side because everything is pushed laterally. That's why in most of the cases of chordomas, we prefer the endoscopic endonasal approach. This is one example I want to show you. This was um, um, 
a 54 year old male who presented with abducens palsy and neck pain. And you see here in the lower clivus and the lateral part of the ox uh, frame of Monroe, you see a mess moderately enhancing in T2. It's a sprite, it's typical, typical for a chordoma. And you see it extending from the clivus to the condyle on the left side. CT shows nicely the osteolysis with destruction of the condyle on the, on the left side and the lower clivus. So we make an endonasal approach. The beginning of the surgery is done by Professor Hosemann at this time, my ENT partner. He make a maxillary androstomy. Here's the antenate process. Just opened. We opened the maxillary sinus to store the nasal septal flap, which is taken from the right side of the septum into the maxillary sinus, so it's out of the way. Then the dorsal bony septum is resected, and we always create a reverse flap with the mucosa from the contralateral side, and this is then slapped over to cover the mucosa on the uh, denuded septum where we took the flap. Then on the left side, androstomy is done as well. The lower part of the middle turbinate has to be resected to get access to this area. Then the uh, pharyngeal mucosa is cut medial to the oestachian tube and is mobilized. Then the mucosa from the sphenoid sinus is removed to have a good bed for the nasoceptive flap. So all mucosa has to be taken so that the nasoceptive flap can uh, grow very well and heal very well. Then the clivus is drilled with a high-speed drill. The mucosa is more mobilized to get more access in the midline to the lower part of the clivus. This is a video nerve which is exposed after removing the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus. And this video nerve guides you very nicely to the foramen laserum, where the clival carotid meets the horizontal portion of the carotid. So it's a very nice landmark. So we drill more of the bone, and here you see we enter the venous plexus of the clivus, which is in connection to the cavernous sinus, and you see how massive bleeding you can occur. How do we with that? We just inject a little bit flow seal, and then we take a patty to press it on. And then usually you can start with further resection. So the carotid is unroofed to get more space because the tumor is behind the carotid, and then careful, gentle, Dissection of the tumor around the carotid is done. Below the carotid is easy to take. So there's no risk when you stay under the horizontal portion. Then more drilling is done with a curved high-speed drill. So the aim is always to remove as much of the involved bone as possible. You see here's an ENT forceps, which goes almost two centimeter laterally, and you can get all the tumor which is lateral to the carotid. This is a tumor part below the carotid. It's taken and we use a 45 degree endoscope. And here you see this forceps, which goes far laterally to get as much of the tumor as possible lateral to the dura sac. Here again, high speed drill. So we drill the anterior part of the clinoid. You see here's a hypoglossal canal already. The dura of the hypoglossal canal. This is a dura of seven and eight. And down here, you see a hypoglossal canal dura. So we remove as much as we can of the tumor from the anterior place. Then the dead space is filled with fat, which is very important. And then we cover it with a nasoceptive flap. It's very important that the carotid is really covered by the flap, should not be open to the, uh, to the air space because this can cause some problems in the carotid, which may later to rupture in the, in the carotid wall. So all the carotid here is covered by the nasoceptive flap. So then we, we um, turn the patient and make the dorsal resection. The whole condyle is completely resected to get a gross total resection of this tumor as much as we can. And we see again the hypoglossal canal here coming into view. And you see the fat, what we put from, from the form, so as a landmark that we really have resected all this, this area. And then the fixation is performed. This is a case of a 40, 47 year old female with neck pain, and she had this thyroid cancer previously. So initially a biopsy was taken. You see here, there is a destruction in the middle of the, of the clivus. 
And you see the tumor here in the midline, going also intradural. And the tumor goes behind the uh, uh, apex of the dense. Here again, you see the extension of the tumor. And you see here is the venous channels, which go around the foramen of, of magnum. So we have dissected as a soft tissue, and then we start with the drilling. We have to go far down and have to resect the apex of the dense. Here you see the dura coming, and we take the kerosene to remove all of this infiltrated bone and lesion. Here you see the transverse ligament of C1. It's resected because behind there is still some tumor. So you see the dura here is exposed. So the dance is resected and the soft tissue behind. Then we go laterally to the dura sac because there is tumor on the right side. We resect this tumor. And you see is a big piece of tumor is coming here. And we take it out and you see se severe venous hemorrhage may occur because there are so much venous channels. But this shows that you have taken the tumor from that area. And when we get hemostasis just by packing with surgery cell. Put a big piece of surgery cell and get a hemostasis here. This is lateral, right? Here you see, this is a midline where the brainstem and the spinal cord is running. So then we come to the area of the tumor, which is infiltrating the dura and is going intradurally. So we resect this tumor. And you see here is a dura, infiltrated dura. We, we resect as much as we can. And then we can look into the spinal canal caudally, and there is no tumor in it. You see here is the C1 branch. So this is the amount of resection we have achieved. And then because there was already taken a biopsy, we had not a nasal septal flap. So we had to cover it with fat and lumbar drain. And you see, this is the uh, post-op result. You see here, here's the resection. What we performed day of first surgery. And then we came in the second surgery we resected the dorsal part of the uh, of the tumor, which was available, and then we make a fixation. And this is C1, C2, because instability is between C1 and C2. So no need to fix the occiput. Here again, you see the muscle lateralis screw, and here you see particle screw and C2. And this is now after the surgery, you see a resection of the tumor, so no obvious remnant in this case. And then she was sent for, uh, for radiation. There's another example. It's a 42-year-old female, had dizziness, tinnitus, hearing loss, balance problem, diplopia, and later even hemifacial spasm. And you see there's a huge tumor in the lower clivus extending down to the condyle on the left side. You see the extension of the legion goes also uh, into the area of, of C2. It shows the carotid is pushed to the lateral side, extension of the tumor down to the uh, condyle and even down to the C1, C2. So bony CT shows the destruction, what we see here in the arch of C1. And also the condyle is taken by the tumor. So we open the sphenoid sinus. We again mobilize the uh, pharyngeal mucosa to the lateral side. And then we resect the tumor, starting in the midline. A lot of drilling is required of the lower clivus. And then C1 and C2, and you see here, this is a carotid artery, and behind we find more the tumor. We go more laterally as far as we can. You see this is a petrous carotid, 
And because the tumor is soft, it was easy to simply suck it off and take a, a cure it carefully. And then we go here laterally and resect as much as we can. You see the door, here is the cellar floor. This is the clivus, it's the carotid on the right side. And here on the left side, the carotid is completely exposed and be behind, we could resect the tumor far laterally because we use a 45 degree endoscope and you can dissect very nicely. And usually the so cordomas uh, are not too sticky. And you see, this is the amount what we had in the day of surgery, we put some fat here inside, but of course we could not take the lateral part and the posterior part of this tumor. That's why the next day we come of a posterior midline approach and then we resect the condyle completely from the dorsal approach. Take all the tumor out so we get here also a gross total resection of the tumor in this area until we found our fat tissue. And then we make a fixation. At that time, of course, because the condyle is involved, we have to fix the occiput to the cervical spine. And in this case, we had very nice um, uh, lamina screws and could fix it to the occiput. And then we put here some bone replace material in between to get a good bone effusion. And this is three, three months after the surgery, then she underwent um, radiation, proton beam radiation. <clears throat> three months after surgery, after the uh, flap was healing. And then oh, five years after surgery, we had slight hearing impairment, but otherwise she's neurological death intact. And so far, we don't see any recurrent tumor growth. And one example of a six-year-old boy, he had a, just an incidental finding after fall, no neurological deficits. And you see here, here seems to be some bone missing, and you see there is the cordoma in the midline going behind C2. And it seems to have an intradural component because the vertebral artery is engulfed, and you see the tumor goes far behind the dense of the second um, vertebral body. So we resect in the midline. You see all this bone looks already infiltrated. We go as much laterally as we can. And you see in the lower part, you see here's a tumor. Tumor is taken with the grasping forceps. Then we had to drill more of the atlas and the dents of C2 to get behind it because we have seen behind there is tumor. You see here, this is a dense. So we resect as much as we can far down, and then we go laterally because the tumor is uh, extending laterally. Then this membrane between the uh, clivus and C1 is resected. Soft tumor, resection is nice. With the suction, you see lateral. We are lateral to the dural sac here. Then we open the dura with scissors to go to the intradural component. We have really resect the infiltrated dura with scissors, and you see the brainstem comes here. More resection of the infiltrated dura to get a gross total resection. And then by manual dissection of the arachnoid plane, not just pulling, you have to be careful whether there are some perforators attached. So by manual dissection of the arachnoid plane, and then the tumor is taken. And then furthermore, as far as we could go laterally with a curved drill, we resect all the infiltrated bone of the condyle. You see here the hypoglossal nerve. So we resect as much as we can to the lateral side to get a good resection. Then we can look into the intradural space. You see the spinal cord goes down here. And then we come from the back. Again, we resect all the condyle to get the gross total resection. And then we make a fixation of uh, C1, C2 again. Here you see muscle lateral screws and uh, pedicle screws on the other side. 
And then he went to proton beam radiation. And so far, no growth. What they found in his hometown is the metastasis in the lung, which was resected, but so far, no other, um, no other uh, problems. Then sometimes you have a problem with the anonasal approach. If the tumor goes too far down, then the anonasal approach is not sufficient. You see here, we had to resect all of C2 from the front. And then, of course, we have to make a combination of an anonasal and a transoral approach. That one's no choice to get all this tumor. You see a severe compression of the uh, spinal cord in the height of C1, C2. And then, of course, if you make such a big resection, you need a fixation of the occiput to, uh, to the cervical spine. And because we have to resect almost all of C1 and also from C2, we need um, a bone graft, which we took from the uh, iliac crest. You see here, there's a fixation, two, three, four, five, and then to the occipital uh, bone. And then we put some uh, bone here in between to have a good bone effusion. And you see, this is amount of resection. Of course, you cannot get this down here from the endonasal, so you need a transoral approach. So what are complications of this approach? CSF leakage is the most frequently complication. We had 5%, even with the flap. In two cases, we had a meningitis. And so far, I had no carotid artery injury. But three weeks ago, we had a recurrent tumor, had four times surgery, two times radiation with proton beam and additional carbon ions. And amid the same technique, like I showed you, very gentle, but the carotid ruptured, and this was a disaster. And I, and I thought I cannot manage it because it was bleeding so much. And then with the cotton patty, I put it, and we see in the post of angio, there is a pseudoaneurysm. And now in the last CTA, it was gone spontaneously without any, any intervention. So we just observe it, and hopefully it will, be, uh, will not recur. So the conclusion is, the endonasal approach is a nice approach for these chordomas, even if they go more laterally. Of course, it's not enough to make just the midline approach because you have usually instability because the condyle is involved or C1, C2 is involved. So anyhow, you have to come from a posterior approach to make a, um, um, a fixation. So thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Henri, for the description of uh, those interesting cases. So. We will move now to the, you, Massimiliano, and uh, we will listen with interest your talk about curing malformation, please. We cannot listen to you, Massimiliano. You... Do you hear me? Yes, no, it's perfect. Okay, perfect. Do you see my slides? Not yet. No, don't you uh, see? Yes, yes, it's right. Yes, you see. Perfect. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. After this outstanding surgical and anatomical presentation, I am in a little bit trouble because my presentation was more theoretical than uh, practical. But I think that uh, it deals with uh, very challenging uh, uh, topics. Chiari malformation or Chiari formation, according to uh, Atul Goel uh, doctrine. As you know, we have uh, many types of uh, uh, Chiari malformation. A uh, type zero is uh, uh, Chiari symptoms without cerebral uh, ectopia. Type 0 0.5 is uh, Chiari symptoms uh, with syringomyelia, but without uh, um, conciliary herniation. Chiari 1 is a complete or partial herniation of terminal tonsils at least 3-5 millimeters, uh, not always associated with uh, syringomyelia. Type 1.5 is the one that we like more as craniovertebral junction neurosurgeon. Uh, it is uh, uh, Chiari malformation associated with the basilar invagination or odontoid retroversion and the descent of the brainstem. Chiari type 2 uh, is uh, the more complex uh, uh, malformation in childhood associated 100% with the spinal dysrophism and the hydrocephalus. Type three 
is uh, uh, occipital <coughs> cervical hernia containing cerebellar tissue, type four, aplasia or hypoplasia of a cerebellum. But we know that there are many other uh, new definition up to Chiari five in order to further complicate this uh, already challenging uh, topic. You can see a, a very uh, um, clear uh, neuroradiological summary of uh, what we have said. And um, the most important uh, difference between Chiari 1 and Chiari 2 is uh, the emergency significance of Chiari 2 compared with uh, Chiari 1. Um, in fact, uh, this is uh, a inferior vermis medulla for ventricle herniation caudal to the uh, foramen magnum, generally associated with the syringoma ilia and uh, hydrocephalus and uh, respiratory distress as well. This is a, a typical Chiari 3 malformation, uh, very impressive and not compatible with life. But now we move uh, to our short uh, um, uh, evaluation uh, inside of uh, uh, different uh, um, uh, Chiari malformation or uh, formation. A mechanical compressive malformation and an attractive uh, malformation. Uh, about uh, the first group, we can consider um, small posterior cranial fossa uh, with uh, hydrocephalus, cranial synostosis, abnormalities of upper cervical spine, including Kippel Fight syndrome, basal invagination, and arachnoid fibrosis. All of those are uh, consistent with the compression of uh, a posterior cranial fossa. On the other hand, <coughs> we have uh, some uh, Chiari feature associated with the traction, that is uh, the opposite of uh, compression. So we have uh, also tetracord syndrome associated or idiopathic intracranial hypotension, which are uh, the surgical indication. According to the literature, uh, who is uh, the optimal uh, candidate? The one harboring clinical symptoms, the one harboring Chiari malformation and the syrinx, and uh, especially, mainly Chiari malformation type two, uh, the neonates uh, for whom uh, surgery is a surgical emergency. Uh, Chiari 2 patient need surgery as soon as possible, as soon as uh, the symptoms are detected. And also uh, in order to prevent the uh, progression of symptomatology. How? We will see in the next slides, but uh, there is a, a worldwide accepted a doctrine about a limited bone decompression, sometimes associated with the duroplasty, especially when the Chiari malformation is associated with the syrinx. And uh, when we deal with the Chiari 2 malformation, that means that brainstem is herniated through the uh, occipital foramen, wide decompression and duroplasty is uh, strongly advocated. In uh, our uh, contribution to the um, challenging topic of cranial vertebral junction, we reported a different way to behave surgically with uh, uh, these uh, diseases, suboccipital craniectomy, craniectomy and durotomy, craniectomy and dural patch, craniectomy, tonsils coagulation, arachnoid debridement, obex opening, dural patch. But since we are cranial vertebral junction neurosurgeon, we like to look specially transoral, transnasal decompression and posterior instrumentation infusion when dealing with basilar invagination. According to many publications <coughs> available into the literature, uh, basilar invagination and Chiari 1 are the, is the most common uh, association in uh, cranial vertebral junction malformation in the adults. But does a vaginal invagination produce 
Chiari malformation through a mechanism of uh, impinging posterior cranial fossa, crowding cranial, posterior cranial fossa. This is the proof. This is our observation 2014. Uh, this is a, a, a young patient, um, 14 years old, uh, harboring a, a basal invagination and the Chiari malformation. And this is uh, the pre op CAT scan. And MRI, you can see here uh, tonsillary herniation and the basal invagination with some uh, dysembryogenetic uh, uh, Kippel file fusion uh, non uh, uh, segmentation um, uh, C1 uh, feature. And uh, soon after surgery, you have a, a why the compression of the anterior part of the cranial vertebral junction, as you can see with this post-op CAT scan, you can see that the bone removal uh, reach the synchondrosis because, uh, between uh, um, the clivus and uh, the sphenoid bone. And you can see that there is not any more compression of the bubomedullary junction, as well as uh, there is uh, a rising up of tonsillary herniation, but you can see that uh, after uh, six months, and uh, you will see around one year later on surgery, you have a regrowth of the odontoid, a regrowth of the clivus, surprisingly, associated with uh, a regrowth of uh, the uh, tonsillary herniation. And one year later on, you can see a quite complete regrowth of both the odontoid and the clivus, and a complete reappearance of the, uh, of the Chiari um, formation, in this case formation, as a consequence of uh, a crowding of a posterior cranial fossa. Literature states that uh, anterior decompression can be considered a novel and promising approach to treating a Chiari malformation type 1 when we deal with the odontoid process in vagination. And uh, Atul Goyle uh, claims uh, C1, C2 instrumentation and infusion when dealing with uh, Chiari malformation since uh, he considered um, tonsillary herniation like an airbag mechanism of uh, compensation of uh, the impingement of uh, anterior, uh, anterior aspect of uh, posterior cranial fossa. And uh, the literature um, is quite uh, cautious in suggesting that C1-C2 fusion for 100% of care patients according to Atul Goy's statement. Probably the distraction of the dance produce uh, a relief of uh, anterior compression of bulbomedullary junction. And it is like an indirect vertebral decompression. And then when we proceed in the compression uh, Chiari formation, we cannot forget hydrocephalus. You can see here uh, hydrocephalus in childhood correctly uh, corrected and drained by a ventricular peritoneal shunt. And as soon as uh, the CSF uh, shunting is uh, stopped by a shunt malfunction, we can uh, note here a relapse of uh, tonsillary herniation as well as a re re occurrence of uh, syringomalia. And when we correct surgically the CSF drainage uh, shunting system malfunction, we have a complete disappearance of the Chiari formation as well as uh, syrinx, not operating uh, by posterior approach the uh, tonsillary herniation, but just correcting the hydrocephalus. Also, kinostosis plays a strategic role, a tremendous role in producing a compression mechanism like a cow, cranio caudal pressure code that uh, excitate in Chiari formation as well as uh, 
syringomalia. Also, tethered cord was claimed in condition arbor with the, associated with the normal sites for cranial fossa. And you know that there is a trend of uh, surgical behavior, especially in Spain, in Barcelona, claiming uh, a, a section of uh, uh, the um, um, uh, final part uh, uh, of uh, the cauda equina uh, by releasing the uh, cranio caudal traction of the spinal cord and this operation uh, that is called the uh, section uh, can be uh, produced by sectioning the filum terminalis by intradural or extradural approach but you know that the italian society of uh, neurosurgery uh, many years ago wrote a negative uh, uh, document against uh, the uh, introduction of uh, uh, the tethering the cord in absence of neuroradiological signs of tethered cord to cure Chiari malformation. Uh, different way to behave, different way to consider the, the tethering of uh, the filum uh, terminalis uh, someone uh, state that uh, um, film terminalis uh, um, cutting reverse moderate degrees of tonsillary ectopia, but the majority of uh, neurosurgeon appointed in this uh, uh, challenging uh, neurosurgery uh, states that uh, the treatment appears controversial and there is not so far a scientific support to propose to uh, push for uh, uh, sectioning the film terminalis in 100% of Chiari. But we move uh, to the final feature associated with a, 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 a attraction in uh, uh, promoting uh, uh, tonsillary herniation, the idiopathic intracranial hypotension. Idiopathic intracranial hypotension is uh, a, a disease associated with uh, a lowering of uh, CSF volume and pressure and uh, producing an hypotension, intracranial hypotension. From a neuroradiological uh, point of view, uh, you can identify epidural CSF collection or nerve root collection of CSF or retrospinal uh, collection. And uh, probably uh, as a consequence of a former trauma or previous spine surgery, uh, some CSF uh, alternative, artificial, iatrogenic, or traumatic pathways to reabsorb in an artificial way CSF is responsible for uh, this uh, clinical picture associated with the subdural fluid collection, like hygromas or hematomas, or enhancement of pachy meninges or engorgement of venous structures, or pituitary hyperemia. And finally, the typical picture of sagging of the brain. That means that uh, the cerebellar tonsil herniates through the occipital foramen with uh, an effacement of the basal systems, bowing of the optic chiasm, and flattening of the pons how to treat this challenging condition conservatively with bread rest, fluid and caffeine or with the epidural blood patch or with fibrin glue uh, patch or by opening the patient and uh, putting a graft to occlude the CSF fistula. So, Conservative approach for a symptomatic patient is uh, the rule. Surgical strategy for Chiari 2 malformation is strongly advocated. This is uh, the past. 
But now we have a consensus conference uh, uh, 2019 concluded and published and another consensus conference in Porto, Portugal, uh, which uh, was uh, uh, held uh, in uh, Brazil, uh, Sao Paulo, in the very beginning of August of this year and will conclude at the very beginning of the month of December of this year with the Delphi trials mechanism. This is the publication of the last consensus conference, 2009. And uh, you see that 100% of uh, the expert panel is uh, in favor of uh, a wait and see policy when uh, dealing with uh, asymptomatic Chiari malformation type one without saying omaelia. When dealing with uh, Chiari malformation type one with syringomyelia, surgery is uh, indicated when uh, dealing with uh, clinical pattern, evident clinical pattern for orocord syringomyelia and for neuroradiological worsening documented in uh, months, following months. Moreover, when we deal with the syringomyelia, polysonography is indicated in case of uh, sleep Andrea apnea syndrome. Again, what kind of surgery? When we deal with the 1.5 Chiari formation, in other words, Chiari with uh, basilar invagination, anterior decompression is the key. Transnasal, transoral, submandibular. It's up to the uh, experience of the surgeon. It's up to the uh, morphometric uh, neuroradiological assessment of the uh, craniovertebral junction bone malformation. Uh, craniovertebral junction fixation, instrumentation, infusion is indicated in case of uh, proved instability and with uh, clear um, tonsillary herniation. And finally, the type of fixation uh, can span from C0, C3 to C1, C2, according to Goyle and according to the local anatomy. So in conclusion, when we deal with the Chiari 1.5, in other words, basilar invagination with uh, uh, tonsillary herniation, irreducible and severe, as well as associated with clinical part, clinical uh, symptomatology, anterior decompression is indicated. When we deal with the Chiari 1.5 with the mild irreducible or reducible basal invagination, posterior decompression with C1, C2 distraction and instrumentation is indicated. When we deal, and I'm concluding my presentation, with the uh, cardio cranial cone pressure effect as the one associated with the intracranial hypotension, we have to perform spinal blood patch. When we deal with the intracranial hypertension, intracranial decompression is indicated hydrocephalus shunting or craniectomy in case of uh, um, uh, craniosynostosis. Finally, when we deal with uh, a tethered cord associated with uh, a tonsillary herniation, section of filum terminalis is indicated. Otherwise, when we do not document any tethered cord at our neuroradiological assessment, section of film terminalis is not indicated. This is uh, our master on craniovertebral junction. I take advantage by this uh, beautiful webinar to remember to all your resident students and uh, uh, colleagues to just uh, uh, communicate that this uh, ENS master is uh, strongly advocated by our skull base uh, uh, group and uh, uh, in brief we will uh, 
perform a competition to identify one free scholarship. Thank you so much for uh, your opportunity. Thank you so much, Massimiliano, for this uh, complete overview of the pathophysiology of uh, this condition and to discuss with us the treatment algorithm in uh, this difficult situation. So we will move to the next talk and last talk of Sebastian Frelich. <laughs> Sebastian, up to you. We move to Paris. Hello, Michael. Thank you very much. It was uh, it was very nice lectures and uh, and videos. So the, the topic you you asked me to cover, or I proposed to cover, was uh, the choice of the approach uh, for craniocervical uh, junction tumor. Hold on a second. I can share my screen now. Okay. Uh, hold on. Sorry for that. Not yet. No problem. Uh, that's the one. Okay. Is it okay? Do you see it? It's not yet. Yes, we do. Yes. But it's just okay, perfect. Yes, it's perfect. It's okay. Wait. Wait. Okay, so so what I wanted to to discuss about was uh, the type of approach I am using for uh, for skull based for craniocervical junction and mainly for um, uh, uh, skull based cordoma. Hold on, I have the something in front of me so so as you know the, the craniocervical junction is is a difficult region to reach and and we had some example of uh, extremely complex uh, tumors and uh, and difficult approach by the previous uh, speakers we had some uh, some very nice cordoma cases uh, shown by henry schroeder and the uh, open approach by daniel uh, so the different types of approach that you can use to get to the craniocervical junction, most simple one is a classic midline posterior approach. You can push it more laterally doing a posterior lateral far lateral approach. You can drill the condyle in addition to that to get more anterior exposure. And you can use a more anterior incision with the anterolateral approach. Michael, you've shown it at the beginning. And finally, you can use the endonasal approach. So that's, that's a panel of, uh, of option you have for the craniocervical junction. So our experience, the one I will present you today is based on, the, on our experience with Cordoma. Our approach for this uh, tumor at the level of the craniocervical junction has changed over the years. And as you can see here, 2000, 2009, endoscopic was 24%. We were using quite often lateral transcondylar, anterolateral approach for craniocervical junction and clivus also. But with, uh, with the, uh, the introduction of uh, endoscopic endonasal approach and the description of extended approach, we have been using more and more endoscopic endonasal, 2010-2017, it's 77% of our approach. And in the last years, I have to say, I have stepped back using the endoscopic endonasal approach, using more open approach, especially for the craniocervical junction. So the endonasal approach is great. Definitely, you can go uh, from the clivus to C2, at the level of the craniocervical junction, it's a uh, it's, it's great advantage to be able to go uh, from clivus to, to so low uh, C2 at the level of the CV junction. But when it's going laterally, there is some difficulties to reach 
uh, extension into the condyle or jugular foramen. This is a case where the tumor was going laterally on both sides, quite infiltrative tumors. There is some extension here intradurally. Definitely, it's a piece of tumor you need to remove if you want to be able to cover um, and to be able to cover with radiation therapy, especially proton beam therapy. This is the type of, uh, of resection it needs. We had to resect both the stachian tube here to have this lateral access to the jugular foramen on condyle. We drill condyle on both sides to expose uh, the tumor to have a control of the hypoglossal nerve. This patient was already paralyzed on one side. And at the end of this resection, taking out the infiltrated bone, you have an access to the horizontal segment of the vertebral artery behind the condyle. It's a nice surgery, but for the patient, it's not the end. Uh, he had to be fixed the next day. You see the, the significant instability, uh, and we could not wait uh, to fix this patient. Even more, uh, there is significant mobility in, uh, in such approach, using such approach. And this specific patient complain of, uh, of uh, post-operative symptoms for quite a long time among which uh, nasal discharge, crusting, bad smell. You all know that if you do some endoscopic endonasal uh, extended approach, loss of smell, it was not an approach to the cribriform plate, obviously, but still patient complain of loss of smell if you do a nasoceptal flap quite often. Uh, chronic sinusitis, uh, that's a common uh, finding uh, after extended approach when you do bilateral entrostomy, and even more at the level of the craniocervical junction, this patient, those patients complain very often when the tumor is, is big to velopharyngeal insufficiency. What does it mean? Nasal speech, nasal regurgitation, and anxiety also uh, because of swallowing difficulties. Whenever you work around the uh, stachian tube, even more if you cut it, you have otitis media, and it quite often end up with a tube uh, at the level of the tympanic membrane. Healing for this approach takes a lot of time, three to four months at least. If it's a polluated area, it can be much more. And patients sometimes with proton beam therapy, they can have those side effects for an extremely long time, sometimes forever, because they had proton beam therapy, 74 gray, that makes all those symptoms worse. So for those tumors, we have been trying to reduce the aggressiveness of the approach, trying to keep the endonasal anatomy intact, not resecting the turbinate, not resecting uh, the etmoid, uh, on both sides, keeping the septum intact, not using a nasoceptal flap. For this, we are using this technique, holding the endoscope on the section with the same hand and uh, using the working instrument with the right hand. We are not using a holder. We are just holding everything. And with this, the smallest is the exposure, the smallest is the corridor the easiest it is because in fact, the endonasal structure hold supports uh, the endoscope and the instruments. I am using a malleable section, as you can see here, which is rotative. So I don't have to do a lot with this section uh, to manipulate and to guide this section, in fact. Just a slight movement with my two fingers, uh, thumb and index uh, can rotate uh, the tip of this section, which can browse uh, uh, a wide area deep in the skull base. I am working more, more and more with angle instruments. There is a lot of those now available. You even have angle drill available. So definitely you don't need the same amount of space we were using at the, the beginning of extended endonasal approach to do the job deep uh, in, the, in the skull base because of those angle instruments. 
The last concept we have been applying probably between 20 and 30 cases now is to really start the approach at the level of the rostrum of the sphenoid with an incision of the mucosa. This is the entry point of the approach. Before that, we are not touching anything, not uh, removing anything. We make this incision just like we would do an incision in an open approach of the skin. We then drill completely the rostrum of the sphenoid, quite laterally. We, we push the drilling of the rostrum of the anterior wall of the sphenoid sinus quite far laterally. And then we remove the mucosa of the sphenoid sinus. We remove the tumor. We work into this volume of the sphenoid sinus and tumor bed with angle scope, angle instruments to remove the tumor. At the end, we put a big piece of fat and we suture this uh, mucosa here uh, with a 5-0 monocryl running stitch, just like we would close the skin in an open approach. I show you a case where the tumor was extending uh, at the level of the craniocervical junction. This is our incision here. We are peeling the mucosa from the rostrum of the sphenoid. We are drilling the rostrum. This takes a little bit of time. I am using an angle drill, diamond drill. You don't want to injure the mucosa in front of the rostrum of the sphenoid. Then you take the mucosa out. You extend the drilling down laterally as much as you can. You find the vidian nerve, medial aspect, push backward to find lacerum segment. And then you start to use angle drill. Here it's a 70 degree scope. Looking at the petrous apex, you see the back wall of the petrous ICA. This is looking down, same with 30, 45, or 70 degree scar. You drill every pathological or suspicious uh, bones that you see. And at the end, a big piece of fat, and we, we suture this mucosa of the rostrum, the incisions that we have made at the beginning. The mucosa at this uh, level is quite thick, and you can quite uh, easily suture it. It's a little bit painful at the beginning, but again, it's running suture, uh, so it's not, uh, it's not so complicated. It takes patience, but uh, progressively you can make it. Uh, trying to do not necessarily watertight, but reapproximation of this dura of this mucosa, the same that uh, would do a nasoceptal flap. So this is a post-operative uh, MRI of this patient with the fat instead of the tumor. And the big advantage is a uh, few weeks after when we do a CT scan of this patient, and you can see that the endonasal anatomy is absolutely intact with uh, extremely limited complaint. Uh, this patient was washed his nose for a few weeks, but not more than this. But you see that the anatomy is intact. So definitely, we are trying to reduce the footprint of our endoscopic endonasal approach at the level of the clivus, but also at the level of the craniocervical junction. This is a tumor cordoma that is located lower than the previous one. This is a perfect indication for endoscopic endonasal. And uh, we, we, we expose this uh, following the inferior uh, nasal floor uh, by nostril approach, but we don't touch uh, the septum. We just uh, use the coanal arch on both sides to access uh, the tumor. We are doing a U flap here uh, that we push down. We drill the lower aspect of the clivus, and with a 30 or 45 degree scope, we drill down a little bit of the anterior arch of C1, and we look for the tumor along both odontoid process. At the end, we use coagulation, monopolar coagulation, to sterilize as much as possible the surgical field, and we put back the youth flap. Here also, mobility is very limited. I show you some more extensive tumor now. This was a case of a recurrent cordoma operated several times in another institution through the nose, but also through a retrosic approach. It's a complex tumor because you have different uh, uh, compartments uh, 
uh, anterior to the anterior arch of C1. It's going also in the lower clivus. It's extending laterally on the petrous apex. And you have two big bulk here of tumor in the prevertebral space. So there is no perfect approach for this. It's a case we've done uh, probably seven, eight years uh, before. So we were not using this concept of minimally invasive approach to the nose, but uh, still it would have been difficult to use this concept in this case. We decided to go endonasal for the extradural part and to go intracranial uh, for uh, the intradural part of the tumor. Why? Because there was two previous surgery, probably a lot of scar tissue and a tight relationship with the vessels. So this is coronal slides. So again, endoscopic endonasal for the extradural part and the uh, uh, far lateral transcondylar for the intradural part. This patient had two retrosig be before, so we consider that retrosig was not enough. So this is the approach. You see that there was a big uh, nasal uh, uh, defect caused by the previous surgery. So this is a classic extensive approach with transpterygoid on both sides. Uh, to expose the tumor at the level of the clivus and also at the level of the craniocervical junction. Here, we are using the shaver to take most of it, and we find a plan in the prevertebral space between the tumor and uh, the pterygoid muscle here on the pharyngeal muscle. Drilling of the condyle to, to, to take the pathological bolt, uh, bone out, we just saw here the iboglossal nerve with resection of tumor above and below, and at the end, closure with an azoceptal flap. That's a postoperative MRI. Not bad, but obviously there is still some tumor. It was not the goal to resect everything. There is tumor here behind uh, lateral mass of C1, a long endotoid process, uh, a piece of tumor into the brain stem here. Uh, and, and some tumor in the petrous apex. So with, with this post-op MRI, perfect uh, cartography of the tumor, we go back with a far lateral transcondylar, we expose uh, the, the condyle, we transpose the vertebral artery, we drill the condyle, get to uh, the lower clivus, uh, find here the fat of our previous operation. It was done several weeks after. And then we go intradurally, uh, tracking the pieces of tumor identified on this pre-op MRI. Here, that's the most important piece, uh, the one into the brainstem, I mean, pushing the brainstem uh, that needs to be taken out for proton beam therapy because this patient was able to get proton beam therapy as uh, 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 he had not, uh, she had not radiation therapy before. So post-operative MRI is not perfect. There is still this piece on the opposite side of the odontoid process that we could not take out. I show you another uh, complex case like this one, very extensive tumor going bilaterally and uh, with a posterior extension here, uh, quite significant on the left side. Here again, pure endoscopic endonasal. I don't feel it possible to take everything out. And definitely I, I consider that it's a risky uh, approach because of relationship of the tumor with carotid artery on both sides, parapharyngeal, but also with uh, the vertebral artery, and maybe some intradural extension with uh, relationship with the pica. So here, uh, another concept, pure far lateral approach, both sides with endoscopic assistant. We published uh, uh, two years ago, uh, our series using this strategy. So this is the video of it. Uh, we are using a midline incision with focus stick, mainly on one side, control lateral incision on the opposite side also. But here it was mostly on the left side because that's what that's where uh, the vast majority of, of the lateral extension was. Transposition of the vertebral artery here from C2 to C0. Disadvantage is that you have to complete, to, co to cut completely the C2 nerve root. There is no way we can cut it on this side. 
Uh, here we expose this posterior extension of the tumor. Once it's exposed, you see once the vertebral artery is transposed, we have a fantastic corridor. Uh, we can easily drill the condyle, we can easily drill lateral mass of C1, and progressively we get the surgical plan between the tumor and the anterior aspect of the dural sac. The difficulty is for this upper extension towards the jugular foramen. This is a risky part and uh, not so easy. Uh, around the hypoglossal canal, it's also uh, uh, difficult uh, to identify the hypoglossal canal, which is quite ascending into the condyle. And then once we have resected everything on the left side, we take the endoscope inside and we, we remove the part of the tumor anterior to the dural sac, going up into the clivus, going down into the odontoid process. There was some tumor into the odontoid process, even if there was still the cortical bone of the odontoid process, uh, infiltrated bone that we can, that we try to resect as much as possible. And then we go to the opposite side, uh, a little bit of exposure from behind also, without transposition on the opposite side. And at the end, we put a piece of cement. And the main advantage is that we can do the fixation during the same stage of the surgery. It's a kind of all-in-one resection. So that's a post-operative MRI, post-operative scan on the fixation. This is another case, extremely similar to the other one. We did exactly the same type of approach midline approach, uh, far lateral, patient supine for fixation at the end of the surgery. Uh, the, I will skip the video because uh, we, are, we are quite late. Uh, uh, and, uh, and this is here, uh, the, the post-operative scan. Uh, we bended the roads here for proton beam therapy. Uh, it, it, it make it easier for the physician. To, to plan proton beam therapy. Here it's another similar case uh, with more extension intradurally. And for an intradural extension with this posterior lateral, far lateral approach, you can easily open the dura and have an access intradurally. Uh, decided also to do this strategy because of the relationship between the tumor and the brain stem and the vessel. You see that there was contrast enhancement here which make me think that there is PL vascularization of this piece, which would be quite difficult to resect endoscopic uh, through the nose. So here, same strategies, uh, using the condyle as a way up to go into the petrous apex and clivus. Uh, this is here, the exposure. You see that there was a pathological fracture of the condyle. I drilled a little bit the mastoid to have access to the jugular foramen and also here uh, on the right side where most of the tumor was. Uh, and then you use the condyle as a, a keyhole to get into the anterior aspect of the tumor. Resect everything just behind the, the, the prevertebral space. And once uh, this is done, you can put the endoscope inside and, and work on the superior aspect of the tumor. Here we were into the petrous apex, looking with a 75, 70 degree scope to the petrous ICA from below. And this is mucosa of the sphenoid sinus that obviously we, we kept intact. And at the end, beauty of this surgery, you can open the dura uh, to take the intradural part. And I was happy to have uh, control of my microscope because as I suspected it, it was an infiltrative tumor uh, surrounding the vessels, uh, quite difficult to resect uh, even with the microscope. So here, final advantage is that uh, you can take completely out the infiltrated dura. Uh, endoscopic endonasally, the more you open the dura, the more you increase the risk of leakage here because there is no communication with the nose, you can, you can resect completely the dura. You need a careful closure of the mastoid process, uh, but it's much easier to close than uh, du, 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 clival dura from the nose. Little stroke here on the amygdala uh, because of this PL infiltration. I finish with uh, two cases where we choose an anterolateral approach. 
which is also very nice. Uh, it's more for unilateral tumors, not expanded bilaterally like the previous cases. And it's nice for tumors going down to C2, C3, uh, because with an anterolateral approach, you can expose completely the cervical spine from uh, C0 to C7. I will not uh, discuss it because Michael showed it. You can easily expose the jugular foramen also with drilling of the mastoid process tip. And uh, you can have an access below the hypoglossal canal, above the hypoglossal canal, between jugular foramen and hypoglossal canal. This was a, a work that one of our previous fellow did looking at also the exposure of the clivus you can have with this approach, putting an endoscope inside uh, and drilling the, the clivus under endoscopic guidance. This was a chordoma with uh, a patient that we cure uh, about seven, eight years after the first surgery. Uh, so proton beam therapy had been done here, but you see that there is a fracture on, of this recurrence, fracture of the bone with this recurrence. And there is another part of the tumor, second location here at the level of C5. Perfect indication for anterolateral. There was nothing else uh, in the body, uh, but perfect indication for anterolateral because you can reach C5 uh, and also C2 with the same approach. So here in this video, I think I don't show C5. I just show the C2 exposure, transposition of the vertebral artery here. You have the 11 nerve. I was working below 11 in this case. <coughs> this is the tumor here. And this is a transposition of the vertebral artery from C3 to C0. It's a little bit challenging at the level of C2, C3, uh, more difficult to transpose. But once it's transposed, you have a, a free way uh, to, to resect completely C2, lateral mass of C1, uh, until you reach the opposite side. So a fantastic uh, corridor to resect completely C2. This is putting the endoscope inside, drilling the upper clivus. This is hypoglossal canal on one side, and I am drilling the clivus between both hypoglossal canal. At the end, this piece of cement, and uh, on the same, this patient was operated as a second stage for a fixation. I finish with this final case, uh, same type of chordoma, extending intradurally uh, from one side to another. Uh, here, we decided to use the anterolateral approach with also a mastoidectomy to expose uh, the laterals along the anterior border. Oops, sorry. Sternical. The jugular foramen, because the tumor was extending on the right side into the jugular foramen. So here, detachment of the gastric muscle. Uh, this is 11th nerve. Here, this is C1 transverse process. A detachment of the muscle from the C1 transverse process. Posteriorly, opening the transverse foramen of C1. <clears throat> transposition of the vertebral artery, uh, which give access to lateral mass of C1 on condyle. I verify that there is still some flow. You have to be careful with the manipulation of the vertebral artery to avoid dissection. Here is a drilling of the mastoid jugular foramen is open. And you see the tumor here, which was quite high, hidden by the tip of the transverse process. If you don't drill the mastoid or the mastoid process, sorry, if you don't drill the mastoid, uh, you don't really have a nice access. And at the end, I open the dura retrosig to, to, to take this part of the tumor that was intradurally, <coughs> multiple ball of tumor in between the vessels. Here also, the advantage of a retrosig exposure to open the dura and have a nice access intradurally instead of taking some risk through the nose. This is putting the endoscope at the end. I am looking here in the spinal canal down. You see the cervical uh, spinal cord, uh, no tumor. On the opposite side, you have this little piece of tumor, uh, just medial, I believe, to jugular foramen, yes. Uh, so we took this final piece out. And this is looking up with both six nerve uh, uh, going into the Dorelos canal. 
And at the end, the same then for the posterior lateral approach, you can resect the dura that you believe is infiltrated much more than what you can do with an endonasal approach. So uh, this is the three options for me. Far lateral endoscopic assisted, it's nice for extra and intradural tumor when it's going bilaterally, lower clivus, condyle, C1, odontoid. When it's going below the odontoid process, it's not so great of an approach. Anterolateral is better. Main advantage, you can fix during the same stage. Anterolateral, extra intra, but whenever it's going intradurally, it's a little bit more tricky to open the dura. Uh, more for unilateral tumor, lower clivus, condyle, C1 to C7, perfect to cervical and craniocervical junction chordoma. And it's better also for the jugular foramen compared to far lateral. Endoscopic endonasal, extra intra, but whenever it's intra, you have the risk of CSF leakage. Clivus, C1, odontoid, below odontoid, it's difficult to, to expose. Petrus apex, condyle, medial aspect of the jugular foramen. Be careful also with chordoma with fixation because fixation can uh, be difficult for the radiation oncologist and sometimes they cannot do proton beam therapy because of the metal. Thank you very much. Everybody is, is gone. So much. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. <laughs> yes, impressed, uh, nothing to say after your talk. You, it's impressive to see how you change your strategies when facing such difficult tumors. Uh, I remember uh, some talk that you show a few years ago, reaching the vertebral artery from the nose with your endoscope. But now I see that you do the contrary. You come from behind and you reach the intra petrous carotid and uh, all the structure. Uh, it was very interesting. Can I make a comment also, please, uh, to all yes, these sure. beautiful presentation, outstanding and really on the top of... Uh, our uh, state of art of uh, uh, neurosurgery, complex neurosurgery. But I didn't find any uh, presentation concerning the submandibular retropharyngeal approach. Is I don't uh, uh, remember, um, if I remember well, uh, no one spoke about this uh, issue. Retropharyngeal submandibular uh, approach, McAfee approach. As, uh, as you know, there, are, uh, there is a big deal of interest concerning uh, some modification of the classic nine step McAfee approach. Uh, there is uh, an Italian uh, author, Pasquale De Bonis, who published four steps for submandibular retropharyngeal approach. And personally, I experienced it one week ago, two steps retropharyngeal approach, which is uh, uh, now under uh, evaluation for publication. And I think that uh, when we rule out the risk of damaging hypoglossal nerve as well as superior laryngeal nerve, I think, I really believe that subandibular could substitute transoral for sure and probably could uh, compete with the transnasal since uh, Salle published in 2017 is a cadaveric experience uh, stating that with submandibular, classic submandibular approach, you can reach all the clivus bone. So I think that we should uh, uh, more raise the attention to this very interesting extra mucosal, totally extra mucosal uh, approach to the cranial junction. And I think that uh, it should uh, really be surprisingly interesting. Any comment? No, I th it could be an option, I agree. But my, my issue with this approach is uh, first the mandible, which is quite often uh, a little bit in your way for retraction. The angle of the mandible on the 12th nerve. It's uh, it's an issue with 12, 12 and descending branch. And you are more uh, working with uh, the lower cranial nerve. 
With the anterolateral approach, you absolutely don't deal with the lower cranial nerve because you're going behind it. So you, you elevate everything uh, and then you go up. Yes, there are a lot of uh, structures which are uh, going medially to the vessel, internal carotid artery and internal jugular yeah. vein. Indeed, and dissecting laterally to the internal jugular vein allow you to move everything in one flap, I would say. There is nothing unless the 11 cranial nerve that uh, will cross your field. And if you work above it, which is the case for craniocermical junction, the 11th nerve is, is really not an issue. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but it's uh, still maybe for tumors which are infiltrating uh, hypoglossal canal, this, this could, be, could be interesting because hypoglossal canal in those cordoma patients is, is still difficult. And Henry showed some videos where, I mean, you, you need a lot of experience to, to expose the hypoglossal canal, the hypoglossal nerve in a cordoma where there is not a landmark of the bone. It's, uh, it's, it's difficult. And when you have sometimes bilateral tumor, one nerve is paralyzed. It's extremely important to keep the other one. You cannot, you cannot risk a bilateral 12 injury. So for this indication, maybe it could be an option. Mm. Any comment, uh, Henri or Jan? Yeah, I agree completely. Or question? Yeah, I have a question. As Malino showed this uh, this praxis, also the team in, in Spain, <clears throat> which makes for a lot of money, cutting of the tethered uh, of the filum terminale. And I heard also a lady from the northwest of Germany, and she came to me and asked me, "Can I cut the filum?" I can. Yes, I can. But why? And she had a chiari with uh, with the syrinx, and I said, "No, it makes no sense." This will not work. And she insisted, no, no, I have here is a good report. So read here. And there are so many patients. They are very so happy simply by cutting, and it is cost just 20,000 euro. <laughs> and she said, I know I have not so much money. Can you do it? And then she had to sign that is an experimental surgery according to her wish. And I strongly advised against it, but it's not a high risk operation, so I can do it. Then I cut. The film, nothing happens. And then she came back after six months, Kayari, same, syrinx the same. Then we make a decompression and then it was fine. So it was clearly an example. This is just to make money. Yes, I think that uh, uh, patient harbory so-called Chiari malformation mostly are functional patients. Patients harboring uh, some... Uh, psychological disturbances. Many of those say that uh, they have a strange, dis strange disease, uh, um, fibromyalgia, uh, something like that, and uh, uh, are very complex uh, um, patient. To operate a Chiari uh, patient with headache is uh, not prudent, in my opinion. And the uh, Chiari patient should uh, undergo a psychological, psychiatric, uh, uh, systematic uh, uh, evaluation in order to rule out uh, functional psychiatric or psychological disturbances, as demonstrated by the one that claims sectioning of filum terminalis. They do not know why, but since it is uh, uh, very on, on mood, uh, very... Um, so considered brilliant surgical option, minimally invasive, they uh, are looking for this alternative treatment. They don't care about efficacy, uh, but they want to fit with uh, the uh, mood, the general mood of that moment. So I think that is a, a very complex, difficult, challenging patient the Chiari uh, patient and um, should be selected as much as possible. Yeah, I agree. But if you have the typical pain, and this is a pain which is initiated by physical strength. So when they press, 
and then they have the occipital headache. I think this is a very good sign that this might be symptomatic. And we have really, we have not too much patients with Chiari, but we have several, they have the typical symptoms. It's a headache when they have some exercises in the gym or when they pressure. And this is a typical occipital pain. And if you see there's a truly a Chiari malformation where the tonsils go down to the foramen, they improve. So I would say this is a good indication. Of course, when they have general like migraine or so, then of course it's not a good indication, but if it's a, it's a typical uh, headache, which is depending on, on exercise, physical exertion, then I think it's a good indication to do it. Yes, I, I, I should add also uh, further neuroradiological examination, like uh, the evaluation of a CSF dynamics with uh, MRI, um, intraoperative, Echography can show that uh, effectively there is uh, a disturbance of CFS, CSF uh, uh, circulation. Not 100% of the patient that we are operating in, uh, in, our, in our OR respond with echo at the same way. And generally there is a, a um, coincidence with the echographic pathological uh, feature intraoperatively demonstrated with for postoperative follow-up. Sometimes we have some unsuccess in present of the tonsillary herniation with neck pain, with headache, but uh, in whom pre-op MRI with CSF dynamic study didn't demonstrate turbulence and uh, uh, difficulty of uh, circulation as well as uh, intraoperative uh, echographic study didn't uh, uh, show as well an engorgement of uh, CSF circulation posterior cranial fossa, especially in uh, cisterna ambience. But, you know, it's still a matter of debate. And the, the reason for which there are so many consensus conference is that that probably is a complex, clinically speaking, complex disease. Thank you for the explanations. So if you agree, guys, uh, you are, your, your patient is without any limit. <laughs> you are very motivated today. Uh, our webinar was uh, two hours and 30 minutes. <laughs> That's the longest one we have never had. <laughs> but I think it was uh, extremely interesting to, to see all your talks. And uh, as I have said, uh, all you share with everybody, your, your passion. So it's uh, a way for me to invite you for the next webinar. We will we'll be uh, organized on uh, 21 December. And I expect that you will be so many to to attend again uh, one of uh, our favorite activity so if you agree i see you i see you bye bye and uh, bye. The next time with uh, bye bye with bye, okay. bye thank you to yeah, all of bye you bye. for those uh, outstanding lectures bye 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 good evening bye bye good evening, good evening.